My name is Melinda Kenaway, and I am a co-founder and the executive director of QDOS, um, or QDOS, I should say. Now I'm on this, this side of the Atlantic. So how many people in the room are familiar with QDOS? Pretty good, maybe about a half of you. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. Um, what, what we do is we're a specialist dissemination platform and that's not what I'm here to talk about today, but in building that platform, we have done a lot of research and had many discussions and spent probably five years learning about the dissemination space and what's happening here and how we can support researchers in getting more um, attention for their work. So the um, title of my talk is From Team Science to Team Dissemination. And uh, first of all, I should say something about that word dissemination, because whenever I use it, um, people say, that's not what we need to do. We need to do engagement. Or people will say, oh, is that communications? Or what do you mean by that outreach? And we find all over the world in different countries, different people mean different things by these different terms. Uh, and I know there's a lot of subtlety and complexity around that, um, which I'm not going to get into today. Um, but from my point of view, uh, what I mean by them in this talk is telling people about your work as a researcher, um, involving people in your work, discussing your work on any kind of channel in any kind of way, and increasingly at any point in the research process as well, and certainly not just at the end, i.e. with a publication, um, but right at the beginning too, that kind of very early stakeholder engagement. So that's what I mean by dissemination. So where to start? Because um, the modern world has a thousand ways to um, be able to communicate research. And yet, and still, uh, until relatively recently, um, you talk to most researchers and what they think of as dissemination is publication, which is, of course, a good way of communicating research results, um, particularly to very specialist audiences. But it's not the only way. And um, the end point of the project is only one stage in the research workflow when it might be useful um, to be able to communicate and engage potential users of your research. So large swathes of the research community are actually incredibly active uh, in communications. When we sort of get in and talk to groups, university departments about what they're doing, they are doing a huge amount of communicating. Um, conference posters, press releases, they're undertaking consultancy, they give keynotes, um, they go to museums and schools and give talks. They set up project websites. Um, they use sites like ResearchGate and Academia. Uh, they run workshops, write blogs, create infographics, videos. You know, there is a ton of stuff um, being done that's really progressive. I mean, some of them even take out advertising. Um, when we look across all those activities as a collective, uh, some of them are undertaken by centralised specialist staff within a university or research institution. Um, the vast minority of all those activities actually, and I'll come on and show you some data around that in a moment. Um, some of them are led by project managers within research teams or sometimes somebody who's allocated as a communications specialist, they have a particular skill um, in, in that area. And others are done by researchers directly themselves, increasingly um, using social media and, and email, and obviously going to conferences. Um, so th there's a whole bunch of, of communication going on, but this rarely happens in a coordinated way. Um, so this is kind of a picture I have in my head of all of that communication and what kind of music is, is emerging when it's done in that uncoordinated way. Is that a tune people really want to listen to? Um, what I have in my head on the other side is where potentially we could be, shouldn't research communication be more like a symphony um, where everyone plays to their strength in harmony with others to ensure that the important knowledge that we're generating through the research um, expenditure is understood in a way that can be acted upon 
but that takes a, a quite a lot of coordination. You need a score and a conductor and specialists on their instruments. Uh, and how do you take those uh, skills and devolve them down into the many kind of units of research activity that we have um, within universities and, and elsewhere? So that's the challenge, and, and before I come back and give you some thoughts on that, um, certainly that we have a, a kudos on how to solve some of those problems, I thought it might be useful just to dig into some of the data that we've collected as we've looked at some of these problems. This particular slide goes back to a survey we did in 2016, so it's already starting to be dated, um, but I've got some more up-to-date uh, information in a moment. But this was a kind of foundational um, piece of research for us in, in understanding how and where um, researchers were currently communicating. Um, we had about 3,000 responses to this survey. And you can see that the most common way in which people um, are disseminating their work is at conferences. But it's interesting that academic networks and profile sites such as ResearchGate are just a couple of percentage points behind that already back in 2016. Um, this is closely uh, followed by conversations with colleagues and um, institutional repositories and email um, and social media already uh, a couple of years ago, pretty mainstream in terms of individual researchers' usage. And um, when we were looking at this data, we noticed two, I think, particularly um, interesting lenses on which we could consider it. I think the first was that um, the way researchers are currently communicating is to pretty narrow specialized audiences. You can see in blue here on this chart the dominance of peer-to-peer -peer communication amongst academics, um, which is of course very important. Um, but the requirement to communicate with broader audiences uh, is ever-growing um, and different countries have different um, approaches to this and different funders are placing different emphasis on this. But to give you an example, in the UK, RCUK, the um, research councils of the UK, are recommending that something like between 5 to 10 percent of the grants that they give out are spent on dissemination and impact activities, particularly to reach outside of um, academia. Um, and National Science Foundation have a similar broader impacts agenda. So the pressure when you talk to researchers is not on communicating to their peers, which they feel is being well served by the current system, um, but it's on communicating outside of those groups. The second dimension that we uh, considered when we looked at this data was, well, how possible is it to track and follow and analyze some of this activity that's being done? Um, and uh, so here I've divided those activities into digital visibility and those things are a little bit more under the radar. So in green, um, these are things that you could um, track somehow through all metric data um, and th there's a pathway you can find how successful those activities are. But a lot of the activities here in grey um, are very difficult to, chat, to track. Um, they don't generate a record of their existence. Um, you would have to somehow be plugged into email servers and somehow some, have some sort of tagging around communication to a policy maker that was just an email from an academic. So there's huge amounts of stuff that's being done that, that's totally um, invisible. Um, so of all that communications activity that's going on, much is being lost in this sort of black hole. Um, we've got no way of knowing what is actually effective. And um, the other analogy I like to think of is this kind of gravitational pull back to peer-to-peer -to -peer communication, um, retreating back to that, um, getting sucked in. So um, unless we're able to bridge this gap between these highly technical conversations um, with those that are going to use the research, such as policy makers, um, educators, and so on, um, we have this, what's been called, knowledge chasm between those producing the research and those wanting to use the research. And um, to our mind, crossing that chasm is about building communication bridges. So I said I had some um, more recent data, and this is from a survey that we did earlier this year. Um, and we looked uh, into a lot more detail at how much time was being spent on dissemination, um, how much money is being spent, 
how important people think this is, what sort of audiences they're trying to reach. Um, we had over 7,000 responses from all over the world, mostly fairly established researchers um, was the sort of the demogra demographic um, shape of the data. And out of that um, research, loads of valuable data, um, but five key observations um, that we thought were particularly pertinent. And the first is that researchers are spending a significant amount of time disseminating their work. This specifically excludes publication. That's how we asked the question. Um, for almost a quarter of those responding, it's a day a week. That's a lot of time. Um, a second quarter spend two to four hours per week. Uh, so that is, is not an insignificant activity. <laughs> Uh, the second observation that we made is that researchers are doing this, this um, dissemination with limited support. So a quarter of researchers do all their own outreach. And over three quarters say that of all the outreach that happens for their work, only 10% of that is do done with central support. 61% say they get no institutional help at all. So, you know, researchers, we want them to be professional communicators and we want them to be business managers and all these other things. It's a huge weight of um, responsibility uh, on their heads without necessarily the skill set and support to do, do it well. So um, the third observation uh, we made is that this agenda for reaching outside of the academy is um, coming along really fast. Um, everyone is feeling the pressure. They're being asked to report on it. They're being measured by it. It's becoming a career success factor for them, and yet they don't have the skills and, and support and mechanisms to translate this, this um, technical information into the right forms for these kind of audiences. And these were the audiences that um, researchers were prioritizing, educators, policy makers, industry, and the public. So, you know, I know there are some extremely well-funded, multi-million pound, cross-collaborative projects that pay um, big consulting firms um, a, a lot of money to do some of this communication for them, but most people don't have access to that even at quite a high level. Um, we've been working with a group from a UK university with a 10 million pound grant who still couldn't get central support or consulting support with that and were, were being asked to do this work by themselves within their own resources. Um, so when we talk to researchers about this, they say, look, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the money, I haven't got the skills, but I know I need to do it. And I know that this is my route to broader impact. And I know that over the next five years, that sort of activity is going to shape my future success in winning funding, um, which is good for them. But more importantly, when you start looking at how long it takes research to get into practice and the many studies that have been done that cite 20 years <laughs> or more to take this technical knowledge and get it applied, there's a kind of social um, cultural health benefits around closing this time gap between research being published and being understood um, by the people who can use it. Uh, the fourth observation um, we made is how much money is being spent on these sorts of activities. Um, I mentioned earlier the RC UK in the UK say you can spend between 5 and 10% of your grant on dissemination and impact activities. Um, RC UK give out £3 billion um, in funding every year. That's 150 to 300 million potentially being spent on these sorts of activities. Um, Horizon 2020 um, recommends something like 4 to 5%. 425, not 45, although that may come. Um, four to five percent of their grant uh, on dissemination and outreach. They're an 80 billion um, euro seven year program. Um, so when you start looking at all the different funders and their policies and what they're suggesting you, you should be spending on these activities, and we added all that up, we came to about seven billion US dollars annually. And what is that being spent on? Um, it's being spent a lot on people, 
It's being spent on stuff being repeated and done inefficiently with no measures of success, um, no organization. And I, you know, the, the potential waste around that is, is, is huge. Um, but you can see from this, this graph here, some people are spending even more um, than that. 12% of researchers are spending 11% of their grant on outreach, dissemination, impact type activities. Um, and another 22%, 6% plus. So, you know, there, there is a lot of money going into this area with, with very little evidence on, on what works and very little support. Um, so the fifth uh, point that we noted is that um, uh, despite all of that money being spent, nobody is tracking this or very few people are tracking or paying attention to this. Um, so 50% of researchers that we spoke to don't track or log dissemination. There is a mad scramble. Um, at the point of having to report to a funder of grabbing some Excel spreadsheets and some Word documents and running around the team and ringing up your collaborators to say, what have you done? And I'm putting it all down and, and putting a, a few basic metrics. Um, but that, that isn't going to cut it in the future, I think, when this becomes more formalized and um, future grant allocation is more linked to past performance too. So um, just to kind of summarize some of those points, um, we're currently reaching very narrow audiences through the kind of communication channels that people are using. This uh, focus on peer-to-peer -peer communication means we're missing the opportunity to tailor um, the way we talk about and communicate research results for different audiences um, with different needs. The researchers are trying to do all of this um, with very limited access to centralized support. Um, and they have very little data um, on how uh, effective different activities, different channels, should I spend my time in academia or research gate or should I, would I be better writing a blog? Um, they're doing all of this and spending a lot of uh, money on it, pretty much with a blindfold on. Um, and they have limited guidance tracking uh, around any of that. And yet at the same time, there is this growing pressure from funders to um, demonstrate and deliver uh, impact, but nobody knows how to get it. So a lot of people spending um, a lot of money and technology time looking at how we measure impact um, over a very long period of time, which is a, a job that needs doing. But even before that, how do we um, communicate this work in the most effective way so it optimizes its potential for impact? And there's been a lot less attention um, on that. So um, just a couple of words about Kudos. Um, the, this, these were the ideas that myself and my co-founders were considering five years or so ago that we launched this service, not a platform, um, a service that brings together a number of data sources that tracks how and where people are disseminating information about their publications and, and what the results of that are. And um, having listened to Lenny's presentation a moment ago, I um, understand the challenges of, of building community and we've worked very closely with the publishing community in the last five years um, to build a uh, an fairly active user base of a quarter of a million researchers using our service. But publications are just one part of the picture. Um, they're the end point often of a project and everybody wants to know how can we communicate at an earlier stage of our project? How can we involve our stakeholders in creating the project? Um, so those are the things that we've been working on over the last couple of years and we are um, going to be launching a a uh, new um, part of our service specifically for research groups, which will be giving a lot more support around 
planning, managing um, dissemination activities across a group or on an international collaboration, giving you sort of visibility on all of those things and, and linking them back to actual results around how far has that information traveled and how has it resonated with people and what were the tangible results that came out of that. So really kind of professionalizing this whole area by using data um, and data over time that means we can um, provide very intelligent recommendations back on to in terms of the impact goals a particular group have and therefore the steps you need to take it that that's the dream that's the vision that's what we're working to in our sort of small small steps that we take and right at the beginning of a project um, as well as at key stages throughout it so we're um, running a, an early adopter program for that at the moment. If anybody is interested, um, please let me know. Um, but as I say, that's not what I'm here to talk about today, other than to say it gives a, uh, it gives a form to otherwise what can be quite conceptual ideas. Um, so central to these developments is the idea of collaboration, hence the analogy of my talk title, From Team Science to Team Dissemination. Um, team science has brought the benefits of um, collaboration to solving some of the very big problems that the world has and why shouldn't we think the same about communications, shouldn't be down to individuals all doing their best, how do we, like uh, the, the symphony um, I used earlier, have everybody playing the instruments they're good at with a music score so they know where they're heading uh, and an audience reaction so they can know if it's um, uh, resonating with people as well. Um, that takes a lot of organization and um, those are some of the things that we're working on. But you know, the, the economic, social, cultural benefits of getting that kind of organization around research communications are, are huge. So I'm just going to wrap up now. Um, I wanted to mention very quickly uh, a, a research um, project that we've just announced at QDOS, um, getting a huge amount of interest, which I think shows that a lot of people are thinking about these issues. How do we move research communication upstream in the research workflow? And we're looking for sponsors and data partners. Um, so again, if that is something that is of interest to you, let me know. We have information sheets on all these things. Um, so uh, get in touch with me on either of those two points or any other ideas you've got for how we can solve some of these problems. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I think we've got uh, some time for questions as well. Yes? Please use the microphone here because of the recording session. Because we disseminate this conference for people who are not here right now. <laughs> Um, somehow this turns up. Ah, there we go. Um, wanted to know, what, you said that there was a 4 to 5% on Horizon 2020 for outreach. How did they arrive at that number? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I do know that it's been gradually creeping up over time. So I imagine that centrally they're doing an analysis of what people are spending it on, what they want to be able to spend the money on, and therefore they're adjusting the budget um, accordingly. Um, I don't have insight on that and how they set that level, but if I were in Horizon 2020, and it is very well organized, I would be doing exactly that sort of analysis. So they're evaluating how, what's, the, what's the, the return on that investment in effect, and therefore setting the investment appropriate. That's why I made a comment about four to five percent but maybe 45 percent in the future because as the analytics get better and we understand actually that the communication part of research is potentially as important as the research itself where do we place that budget slider i would predict it will go up thank you um it was a really interesting talk so on the slide that showed the um, the types of communication um, and the, the survey results. I didn't see publication, like standard academic publications oh, yeah. there. Yeah, we specifically excluded that. It. Um, it would have been top of the chart okay. for sure. That's yeah. what everybody thinks. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then one other thing, do you have advice for a community like FORCE for how we would ma like manage our own communication strategy as a community? Ooh, big question. Um, 
there, you're touching on how you build a community. And um, there are startups um, working on some interesting collaborative tools that help you communicate as a group and then do outreach. Um, it's not what Kudos is specifically designed to do in terms of um, the research process is a very specific one with very specific outputs that actually makes communication easier. Um, the challenge you've got here is you have less outputs and more distributed community. Um, so yeah, I don't have an immediate answer for that. Um, but it's probably it's organizing what, what we in marketing would call your sort of content assets because you're creating just from this talk and presentations, discussions and blogs, it's how you aggregate and organize that information into ways that people can begin to engage more with it. Um, Zapnito is the platform that I was just struggling to remember there. Um, we've done a lot of early work with nature around how you take um, working around conferences, societies, with they've all got the same challenge of a, keeping a specialist community together. M might take a look at Zapnito and see what they're doing. I guess there's a, a, an issue about, again, about words. You talk a lot about communicating, but it's very much what I see here is broadcasting. It's, it's, yes. it's one, you're in the directional, you know, yes. it's not a dialogue. It's not, a, it's a yes. hoping, or it's sort of like advertising in some ways, but you're yeah. hoping that there's an audience that will receive, you know, the communication doesn't happen unless there's a reception and, and yeah, exactly. And how would you, do you have any ideas on how to monitor that? I mean, I, I went to a recent meeting where they talked about public speaking and repeating your message and, you know, trying to ensure that there's some reception at the other end and... Uh... Yeah, oh, that, that, that's such a good question and we, we get asked this all the time and they've got to go... <laughs> Coming back to Lenny's talk, you've got to go through various stages of funding and building to work towards what we might have in our heads and what we would like to deliver. The engagement piece is really um, exciting. Um, some of the early thoughts we've had for that is uh, we already integrate with tools like Paperhive. If you can capture a conversation as it's happening, that is the time that the researcher has the, the point of engagement. So that the very start is hypothesis, Paperhive. There's a conversation. We can alert people to that happening, they can jump in and they can begin to have a discussion. The other thing we get very excited about, we're, we're launching a whole new sort of showcase site and over time we would love to build in direct um, tools for uh, a researcher to cutting out the intermediaries, running their own webinars, um, engaging with a particular journalist and having those kind of two-way conversations and making those public. There's, there's all sorts of things we can do but we're literally chunking it up. Oh yeah, well, yes, yes. So um, yeah, it needs to be sort of thought through in terms of how, which topics and with what kind of expert support you decide to tackle in such a public forum. Yeah. Okay, I'm told that's the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>